Uh, good morning, my name is Meg Detloff and I work for USGS PNAMP. Uh, thanks for joining us for the first 2023 meeting of the PNAMP Fish Monitoring Work Group. Uh, a couple of housekeeping tips. Uh, before we get started, uh, please mute yourself by clicking the microphone icon on your Teams platform. If you're on the phone, use star six. Also, please turn off your camera if you're not speaking. It kind of helps everybody focus. Uh, if you don't see a toolbar, kind of wiggle your mouse a little, and it should pop up on the top or the bottom of the screen. Uh, you should see a bar that looks something similar to what's on my screen, depending on how you're using uh, this part of Teams, like the desktop view or the browser view. Uh, if you have questions or feedback, please use the chat function or raise your hand and unmute yourself. We can mute you, but we can't unmute you. Uh, we are recording the meeting and it will be available on our YouTube channel in the next few days. If you're having trouble with the chat function, here's a couple of housekeeping tips. Uh, you know, try leaving the meeting and rejoining. That tends to kind of kick it into action. Uh, use a different browser. Edge typically works better than Chrome does. Uh, or try using the de desktop version instead of your browser version or vice versa. Uh, if you don't have access to chat, please feel free to unmute yourself and comment or ask questions. This is not a big deal. Um, now with that, um, I'm going to have the FISH uh, Monitoring Workgroup core team turn on their cameras and introduce themselves. Uh, go ahead, guys. Uh, Russell Scrandall with Bonneville Power Administration. And Casey Bliesner is not able to join us today. Uh, she is in uh, another meeting. Want me to go next then? Yeah, go ahead, Nancy. Uh, Nancy Leonard with Pacific State Marine Fishery Commission. Awesome. Thanks, Nancy. Jen Bayer with USGS, PNAM. Hey, Jen. And then I don't know if Lara's here yet. And Marika usually kind of kind of trickles in a little bit late. I'm here. Hello. Oh, hey. <laughs> hey, Marika. <laughs> I feel like we do this every time. <laughs> Yeah, everybody likes to do meetings on Thursdays. Right. Uh, hi, I'm Marika Dobos with Idaho Fish and Game. Great, awesome. Thanks, Marika. Right. Uh, thanks, everybody. Um, now it's your turn. Uh, don't worry about turning on your cameras or your mic. Uh, simply open up the chat and introduce yourself with your name and um, organization. This will help acquaint you with the chat function and helps us keep track of participation. And while you guys are doing that, I'm going to cover today's agenda. Uh, we'll kick the meeting off with updates on current tasks. And then next, Brian Mashoff will do our tech talk on Pithy, a uh, pit tag hyper tool. And then we will wrap up with next steps. All right, let's get this show on the road. Uh, leads for each current task will give an update on progress, and then I will pause briefly after each update for questions and comments. If you have a question after we move past a task, feel free to type it in the chat, or I will circle back after all the updates are complete. And with that, I will hand this over to Morgan Bond for the Carrying Capacity Standards update. Yeah, thanks, Meg. Good morning, everyone. Um, so. If you recall last fall, uh, we sent out a draft outline of what we're calling our best practices document for carrying capacity uh, estimation. And sort of in brief review, what this is, is, is really a document that kind of overview of uh, lots of different techniques that, that people are using um, to estimate carrying capacity for primarily juvenile cell monitoring streams. Um, and so this document is really trying to sort of look at the different types of techniques that people are using and come up with some recommendations for how we might best uh, both use those and, and interpret the results of those types of estimates, because we often have pretty different uh, things under the hood that are doing that. So we set up, we have a draft outline of this document um, and we sent that out in the fall and got a lot of great feedback. Um, we've now incorporated that feedback and then uh, broken up that uh, draft outline into different components that will be written by different authors. We have about half a dozen uh, different authors that we're targeting for different sections uh, of that document. Um, and our, um, right now, uh, sort of uh, targeting, I think, a uh, um, June date to have a draft of that out um, of the full document um, that we can send back out for review uh, by other folks. 
And I think, unless Russ has anything else, I think that's kind of where we are uh, right now on the carrying capacity. Thanks. All right, and Russ gave a thumbs up. Uh, any questions or comments? And feel free to type those in the chat and I can always read them out too for folks that can't access chat. All right, cool, moving on. Next up, we have juvenile density, uh, snorkel and electro fishing and Russell Scranton's gonna cover that one today. I thought Mariko was, I'm just <laughs> kidding. Uh, yeah, the juvenile density uh, snorkel and electro fishing work group is looking at a task to create some standard exchanges or da uh, data exchanges to share uh, juvenile density distribution data. Um, we've had our last meeting in uh, December 2022. We discussed many of the use cases. Uh, ODF and W is actively looking for some development opportunities to manage this type of data. Um, as one case, we also know that the BIOPS terms and condition for BPA um, has a requirement for BPA to share and provide the this information for viability assessments. Um, after that meeting, we discussed a couple examples and use cases. We uh, Dan Isaac presented um, a tool, a fish distribution analysis tool that uh, showed um, how multiple data sets um, from IDFNG, CritFIC, um, Biomark, and ODFNW could be used to um, dist show distributions, abundance, and potential capacities. Um, we've shared and discussed the, the proposed template of a sharing form. Um, asked for comments. We've received a few comments from a few entities to date, uh, Colville, um, some from um, Streamnet. We are planning to meet with Streamnet again one more time here shortly. Um, by the end of January, we're hoping to finalize a form, uh, redistribute it, send it out um, as a basic template um, that will support a data request, a data sharing request uh, from Dan Isaac, uh, where people can submit um, data for use in an upcoming um, re uh, reanalysis of the fish data analysis tool that may be a larger scope for Chinook and Steelhead across the Northwest, not just the interior of Columbia. Um, and as I said, uh, that email probably will be coming out here at the end of the month for an update of the proposed framework. Um, Marika, is there any other comments or additional thoughts for Casey if you did join from your other meeting? I can't think of anything right now, Russ. Okay. Um, right. but you, yeah, we'll thanks. open that up for questions or comments from anybody else on the juvenile density task. All right. Okay, cool. Moving on. Uh, next up, Evan Brown is going to talk to us about uh, task updates for the fish population names and GIS boundaries task. Morning, everybody. Uh, Evan Brown with IDFG. Uh, I've been working with Van Hare in order to develop a methodology for creating and defining and attributing analysis units or management units, um, what we call uh, populations in uh, the previous coordinated assessments efforts. Um, we wanted to do something that was replicable, standardized, and also uh, diverse enough so that we could apply it to many different species, um, including bull trout, which was our pilot. Uh, we completed that pilot with quite a bit of feedback from uh, regional folks, and we are still left with some questions, which we are going to toss back to the technical group, and then refine our methodology and present it to the whole group after that. Um, proof of concept is looking really good. Just in case you haven't seen the other meetings, uh, it's basically just taking existing distributions from like range-wide assessments and status assessments and intersecting it with HUC sixes and then not doing anything with the existing, not changing the existing populations in any way 
just sort of filling in the gaps where we have fish distribution, but we do not have existing management units. So <clears throat> in that respect, um, yeah, like I said, we're at the point where we're going to refine our document with a workflow and order of operations or decision tree and get some feedback from our core group and then present it to the whole group after that. Um, oh, in addition to that, Van, um, I should note that Van has created a web app which will allow us to collaboratively define these populations region-wide um, based upon all of the layers that we can bring to the process. Um, any questions? How's that, Meg? Five minutes? Yeah, it was brilliant. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> all right. Okay, I'm not seeing anything in the chat and nobody's got their hands up or unmuting. Uh, so we'll move along. Thanks so much, Evan. And next up is rotary screw trap operation. And Russ is going to talk to us about that one too. Um, I, at this time, there isn't an update since our last meeting, really. Um, there hasn't been a follow up discussion. Um, we are continuing to work on other tasks at the moment with uh, other exchanges. The, Big uh, issue has been use cases. Uh, while we have um, identified additional use cases, um, we're waiting for uh, further release and discussions through, I think, the uh, Columbia Basin Tributary Habitat uh, monitoring strategy that's coming out with NOAA, the Council, um, and regional partners. And one of the reasons is that they, um, one of the use cases that we've identified is that. Uh, that Columbia Basin Habitat Research Monitoring Evaluation Strategy uh, specifically does ask um, for some of the additional information from screw traps beyond abundance, uh, looking at condition and timing um, for use. Um, our next steps are, steps are going to seek input on the format and discuss with the StreamNet uh, Steering Committee and, and other staff just for additional input. Uh, we will probably be coming out with an up coming meeting announcement at some time prior to summer. All right, perfect. Questions or comments for Russ or Marika? All right. And our last update is on pit array and related pit tag analysis, and Marika is going to go over that one. Okay, hey, uh, this is still a relatively new task. Um, we still uh, haven't got together as a group. We're uh, just kind of outlined in the last meeting some thoughts and ideas that the group has has brought to our attention in the past and think it's important. This will probably end up being kind of a multi-state process with several different potential task products. Um, and I'll focus a little bit on on kind of the the first part of it, which is data management and trying to figure out the best ways of managing pit tag data and its associated metadata, which includes environmental conditions like temperature and flow and noise and how uh, what are the best ways of summarizing that so um, raw pit tag data is very messy. Are there some tools like pit cleaner that can be utilized to help folks that operate pit tag arrays to better manage um, their pit tag data and identify um, the data that they need for their specific analyses? So part of that is coming up with these tools, um, identifying tools that are already built and making them available for folks to be able to use at their specific sites and ways that we can make them flexible for site specific variability. I did meet with uh, sat in on the uh, in stream pit tag detection system subcommittee of Pitagis on January 4th to bring this task to their attention. Uh, we did have um, Dan, is it Dan? Is that right, Meg? Who came to the meeting and presented mm, last Dan time? Isaac. Yeah. No, not Dan Isaac. Um, oh, Gabriel Burks did. 
Uh, Gabriel, Gabriel Brooks. Gabriel, Gabe. So, um, so Gabe already um, presented a little bit on this at our last meeting. So, um, we brought it to the the subcommittee group, and we're going to work with them to make sure that there's communication among the group, working together to uh, ensure that there is not overlap and, um, um. I guess doubling up effort where it's not needed to produce products that are useful to folks. So uh, we'll continue working on organizing the group. Those that want to participate, shoot either myself or Russ an email so that we can start getting a little bit more organized and come up with an outline, and start working towards these products. All right, perfect, Marika. Uh, any questions or comments? One just addition component. Um, two of the topics that also have come up recently has been shared discussion of designs, making sure that we're we have places to update and manage designs um, for how many fish are being tagged, making sure it's coordinated, um, understanding the proper uses of those uh, tagging designs, and uh, when we're looking at pit tag data. So that's one other potential discussion point. And the other thing that we wanted to, to highlight is an opportunity to, as Marika said, talk about pit cleaner or other tools. There's a lot of analytical tools to support designs um, or other components um, to share and analyze or manage pit tag data. I think it'd be, this is an opportunity for us to discuss and identify uh, ways to continue to improve use of pit arrays and pit tagging um, in the tributaries. Uh, for various monitoring needs. Perfect, thanks Russ. All right, and if anybody has any questions or comments for any of the earlier tasks, um, that's the end of the updates. So uh, feel free to type anything in now or always you're more than welcome to contact any of the task leads if you have specific questions and don't feel comfortable asking uh, in this forum. All right, with that, for the Tech Talk today, uh, Brian Mashoff will lead us through the wonderful world of Pithy. I relinquish control. Go ahead, Brian. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to be talking about uh, about a tool for working with uh, Pitagis data, and the the, <laughs> the the goal, you know, you know, everybody comes up with a name for something, and you know, how many people know what what Yahoo stands for, or what the, that acronym means? But it's basically um, just wanted to come up with something to describe what this tool does, and it's it's kind of a simple simple idea that can be extended to a lot of different ideas. The basic problem is is dealing with um, the mounds of data that we have in Patagis, um and varieties of, of uses and how can we kind of make best use of all the resources within the um, the, the, the the team of people working with pit tag data. But this talk, I'll kind of just go through some introductory ideas and that what do we need and the architecture that I was trying to design around. Um, give some examples, try to run through the tool a little bit in, in, the, in some live demos, and then we'll talk about some next steps. Um, usability is a big thing. Um, it's there's really not a lot of good tools for for working with pit tag data. If you bring it in a, a large file into Excel, things get messy very quickly, very large unwieldy data sets, and the data structure is kind of awkward being just usually just a collection of of events or you know rows within a, a CSV file. Um, repeatability refers to lots of lots of studies or uh, metrics being generated uh, based on pit tag data without any clear idea of what query was used or how what the data set looked like that was that data came from and there's not a good way of 
or standardized way of sharing that within the community. Um, so it'd be nice to to think about creating a digital paper trail for data, you know, that maintains the query information as well as any processing that's been uh, implemented to the data beyond that. Uh, interpretability. Um, you do a big query in Patagis and you get a lot of um, basically just a, a bunch of rows of data and it's really been a, several pages of it usually and it's very hard to get a handle on what the data looks like if it's what if you did the right query if it's something that's going on that's unexpected but be able to interpret it both in terms of time as well as across the, the spatial landscape where the uh, events or detection events happen. Interoperability, uh, to be able to bring in a data set easily and then be able to export all or part of that data set to be re you know, reused by uh, other tools. Most people that work with pit tag data have their own methods for, for working with it. Um, and it's rather than try to be one tool for everybody, Certainly, the goal is to be able to export that data for reuse in other ways. Um, so the tool development uh, flows along the following lines. It is thinking about a use case of how one would do the data, uh, one would do a, a, an analysis. First, one would start by querying Patagis, uh, quite often process some data in R, um, and then maybe it's not always the same that you have to change things a little bit, you get a CSV file. Um, and then I would create a tool and I'd you know, maybe use HTML JavaScript and there'd be some reuse of that. I would deploy it on a server and then there'd be data updates. So this is sort of my, um, the way I've been working with uh, for the last few years, creating tools. And it's, it's uh, very customized to a specific uh, query type that I would do in Patagis. And what I was trying to shoot for from my own uh, benefit of working is to something that's a little bit more general. How could I create a tool that would just let me drag any query into Patagia, uh, from Patagis into the tool and start looking at it and then be able to extend that? This is an example of another tool that I've developed that, that's looking at uh, fish moving upstream. And there's a whole bunch of different widgets and things here and a bunch of things that are on a um, you know, tabs in a menu that give me different aspects of that. So I was looking for a general tool that looked like that, except that was was for general use. Um, there are some existing tools that work with pit tag data. Um, uh, pit Pro, for example, is an example of one developed by the University of Washington, where you would have a specific output in mind for the tool. So it's pre-processing a specific query in Patagis. There would be, in this case, um, output for use by surf or roster. Um, Pit Cleaner is another similar tool um, that's that's in our package, and that was originally developed for for a specific purpose as well. Um, although it can be used in general for um, for I for basically processing the pit tag data for for further use. Um, and I did. Uh, look through Pit Cleaner a little bit to get some ideas on what they're doing, and there's a lot of similarities between what Pit Cleaner does and what I do in terms of the processing of the Pit Tag data, and I'll try to talk about that a little bit. My specific goals were just to be able to take Patagis data and potentially Dart data um, that you know many different query types, but be able to bring those into the tool. Um, Load automatically load some environmental variables, and that would be things that are that are located in Dart or available through Dart. The the data from US the US ACE, including temperature and flow at the places where it's available, and then be able to export that data, maybe a subset of the data, but importantly the metadata associated with that. What 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 did the input look like? Uh, to be able to capture what the query was, you know, whether, how that data was generated from Patagis, and also export it with the correlated attributes in some form. And basic functionality, again, load the, the CSV file, but to be able to lo load it from your desktop and not have to upload it, very large data sets. 
but also with the capability of loading remote data sets. Um, have it pre-process the, the data, you know, turn the stream of events or detections into just a basic a fish object structure, do some data reduction, which um, I describe as purging superfluous events. So Patagis can record uh, a lot of events in sequence as close as uh, one second apart. And quite a number of those are not going to be needed depending on the, the analysis you're doing. Load the environmental variables and then allow for interactive filtering of the data. Querying the Patagis, I mean, there's for those most people here are familiar with it, but it's basically two different things you're starting with. The um, there's there's mark attributes that you can that you can filter on to, to capture. There's event attributes and there's query results. Um, and the and you you know your query has a, a a row for each unique contribution of attributes, and the more specific you get, the more rows you're going to get. Um, and so, you know, for example, one one fish would have, you know, this is the, the complete tag history for for one one fish, but our our selected attributes here are just event date and insights and stuff like this. And so you could see that. The, the counts that we have for these particular combinations can get fairly large. So at McNary, we have 22 uh, separate events that happened. Um, and this is a you know, fairly nice, you know, compact set of, of events for particular fish, but we might be missing information. For example, there might be some kind of fallback that happens at, at McNary um, in, in this period of time. We don't know what's going on. This is just in the span of one day, so it could be different. And we can expand that by by using date time instead of date, and that gives us a lot more data. Um, but we and, and and by you know getting date time, we can then order these things by date and see what's going on. But what this allows us to do is identify things like you know. A, the spent overnight in the ladder, did it fall back? And it, to, um, for the for a few of the sites, such as Lower Granite and Little Goose, you can identify whether the fish was transported or not using the the specific um, antenna groups and antennas that were the last detected event. Um, and it's it'd be nice to capture that information before you do any sort of purging of data. So again, some considerations, you know, sometimes you need the antenna information to, to infer what's going on. Um, recording date versus date time only decreases the, the data load by 50% generally, but what you gain from that is being able to order the detections in sequence, which is kind of hard to do um, if you don't if you don't have it uh, down to the, the, the second as opposed to down to the day. Um, but you need a better method for excising these unneeded detections uh, as opposed to just using what's available in Patagis. So specifically what I'd like to do is be able to, to keep these types of detections here. So this is a, a, a snapshot for this one fish. It was coming upstream and it was going past the Dalles and John Day, um, then hit McNary. And for a lot of analyses, you don't need everything in between here. So from it hits the bottom, uh, the bottom most antenna um, up to the, the the counting window that was leaving. So it'd be nice to keep these boundary events, but lose the ones in between. And that's something that you can't really do in Patagis. You have to uh, do that subsequently. And this is something that, that the, the pick cleaner tool does as well to look at, to basically create blocks of detections, or they call it nodes, uh, that you can use to essentially compress the data. Um, the specific arch architecture I was after was one that's completely web based. You don't need to install anything. Uh, you don't need to do any coding. You just basically drag it in. You, the processing is handled locally in your machine. Um, and by working with uh, HTML and JavaScript, I can make a lot more tools available, such as, as map tools and, and, and a variety of, of things that I use to create widgets on for web tools. That's that's readily available. A lot of open source stuff. So the architecture is consists of I'm going to load some files. I'm going to do the pre-processing. 
uh, do some attribution, fetch the environmental variables, and then and then you can start exploring. And then at the end, you can can do some exporting. So, so tool is very simple. It kind of looks like this. You just drag a file there. You can click to load some hourly data. Um, the eventual goal includes being able to load some things from a repository. So that would be there might be a repository someplace that somebody created that has a bunch of uh, query results already set up. Um, and as well, the tool is designed to be able to take the a file as, as appended to the URL as a query string. So in this case, this clicking this link would load up this file with a, a sockeye from 2022. Um, in developing this, it's it's I was you know cognizant of the fact that a lot of different query types can be managed in Quitagis uh, and. Um, really, the complete tech history is is really the, the go to one for getting all the information you need, because um, if you really want to know what if the fish's complete complete experience is, um, all these other ones, you can get it if you do them all together. But um, the simplest way of, of getting that is the complete tech history, which does give you a, a huge amount of data that you have to weed through. But in any of every other case, you risk um, losing some data or missing some information that's that's uh, that's available i will eventually get around to, to being able to process all of these to look at the attributes and um and decide what what file type it is but initial developments just focused on the complete tag history and think about you know the kind of attributes that are sort of required and because you can you know, again, the variety of attribute combinations you can come up with is essentially infinite. But if you really want to know where the fish is, is going and been, you need event date time. You need things like, um, you know, the release dates and, and and the event type. So that way you can fully characterize you know, where the fish is happening. So in this particular case, I'm again looking at this one fish and, and looking at, um, you know, these particular attributes. And I can tell that you know, by by including re event release uh, times and dates, I can see that this fish was uh, was released here, and uh, you know the mark and it gives me the release date. So I have the you know I have both the the mark event, the the release information, as well as the the times that are for all these things that are happening here. So again, I'm going to do this uh, data reduction strategy, removing these intermediate events, uh, with with some exceptions. If if you have, you know, with a certain time window. So if you have um, some interior events that that definitely indicate that that something was going on. For example, perhaps a fallback event, um, and it's sometimes easy to see at McNary because there's so many uh, there's so many weirs that have um that have antenna whereas a lot of sites only have one or two and maybe just the counting window so being able to to distinguish sort of a natural fish progressing up a fish ladder versus one that that fell out or, or fell back and and then had to come back later you you basically go and if, it, if there's two hours that have gone by well you're going to go ahead and maintain that that event because it indicates something might have happened and i'll show you um what can happen or what the data looks like when you identify that. Um, so I go and fetch attributes from Dart and basically, you know, one of the queries that's available is uh, is the, you know, daily hourly water quality. And so what does what does the the application does or what Piffy does is goes in and looks through all the detections or the fish and events that have happened for those the particular fish that you've loaded, it identifies the time spans that are needed for the data, as well as the sites that you need to try to get some correlated data. In this case, I'm going to grab some data from the bon Bonneville Four Bay um, uh, site, and that's going to retrieve me the, the things such as the is the temperature and flow and and uh, dissolved gases. And there's lots of considerations because even for a particular site, 
you know, for example, the 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 potassium sites that are at Bonneville, you have you do have an upstream and a, and a downstream option. There's um, hourly and daily data available from Dart, and it's it's worth considering. Okay, what what type of information are we looking for, and 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 is it is it really necessary to get hourly data? Or is the daily average is sufficient for, for or at least more realistic describing the fish's experience? Especially since the that these sites are, are not necessarily um, exactly correlated with the the fish's experience going through the going past the detection sites. So when we say correlated data, it's data that's happening reasonably close in time and space to our detection events, but but not exactly. So this is the kind of what the tool looks like when I bring it in. Um, after the data is loaded, then it gets um, pop. You populate a whole bunch of uh, interactive filters that you can click and, and, and select things, and then one or more tabs of tools on this side here. There's two two of the ones are shown here. This is a um, a a map that shows uh, um, essentially pie charts that are that are composed of clusters of, of events that happen at specific sites or in, in proximity. And this is what I call a fish tracks chart where the showing in time how the how a given fish proceeds through the whole system, the events that happen, and with the uh, event locations basically ordered from the Columbia mouth through the uh, um, through the top of the basin here. Um, this allows both for looking at, at, at what's happening in time, but also in space, something that's kind of a challenge to do on a map. Um, what the idea here is to be able to use some of these tools to to select particular groups of fish and then create a new uh, grouping of fish within the interactive charts over here. So that way you can visually you know, not only select by the um, using the, the the you know kind of reduce the data by using the charts over here um, on the left, but also by creating new ones to say, okay, I'm just interested in these particular fish that have events here, and that way I can select true or false, and then eventually export those uh, that reduce that from my analysis if if so desired. Um. Part of what we're looking for here is a way of of archiving the data and, and, and what kind of format does that go in? And there's really no standards for that, or but I'm, this tool is designed to introduce some of those concepts and try out some ideas. Um, so we have filtered data that could be a, a select group of fish that um, and their associated detections. Uh, the metadata that is available from Pentagis, which is somewhat limited, and I'll show you uh, how, how that come up with. But there's also metadata that, that, that has been generated within the tool. So, for example, the, what particular selections I've made in the, in the left filters real, that help define, OK, what from the original data set, what was, what was derived or what fish were selected out of that. Uh, some of the things that, that are maintained, such as the title, um, if I get, if I identify the Patagis report type, um, and if I have selected on my Patagis output uh, output um, to maintain the um, the query information that would show up here, but also things like the the date and time, and so I could have one one or more data sets that would be that would be described here and when it was all created. Um, this isn't completely exhaustive. I mean, there's a lot of different things that. I could create such as, as um, custom fields for putting in excess um, additional information so people could maintain a good description of what went into their data set. Um, as far as formats, I mean, you, I've a, a flat file um, example would be structured JSON, which essentially looks like this. Um, but you know, it's it's, uh, it's still human readable, but it is designed to be used by a computer. Um, people are most familiar with flat CSV files, so you can create a um, an output like that. The challenge is if you want to have a lot of metadata associated with that, 
it's better to include it with other files. And so what I've done is create a, a zip output by which you have both the fish events in a file as well as some filters and metadata. And I'll do an export and show what this looks like. But the basic idea is then you have several files within a zip um, file, and this could be maintained as an some kind of an archive. Um, again, from Patagis, if you click this little box here, it says export filter details. It will it will give you a um, that the description that usually shows up in the, in the in the page before this. So you see, okay, what the filter looks like, and that way you at least have some record of what was done in Patagis to get the particular data set that you have. Um, right now, I don't I don't work with an Excel output, so you kind of need a CSV file. Um, and I will the, the, I will get the title as to if you click this there, so that can also work. Um, so now I want to kind of transition and show just a little bit of how this works with a with a simple example. Um, so again, this is what the the application looks like when I start up. Um, if I um, so I can go to to a folder here, and I'm just going to grab two files here. I got one fish, and I have two fish, and I'm just going to going to drag them in here. And the first thing that's happening, since I have this checked, is it's loading the data from Dart for that spans the times the this, this the time span for for these particular fish. And after it's loaded those up, I immediately presented with the populations in the charts here. I've loaded three fish. I have one Chinook and two sockeye. Um, the uh, the Chinook is wild, where the other ones are, um, are, are, are are sockeye, and they're all from the uh, um, the salmon basin. But we have these from the from the South Fork, and then these are guys. The sockeye are obviously from the um, Redfish Lake area. Um, the map in this case it is, is it comes up by default uh, with the pies colored as as a uh, as as the event type, and so right now I have I haven't included the mark. If I do that, I'll get another one. But there's release, observation, recapture, and recovery events here, and we see examples of all of these. And the numbers in the center don't necessarily refer to the number of fish because you can see I have four here, but it's the number of fish sort of times the number of events for each of those fish. So there's in in this case I have both a an observation and a recover and a re. Uh, um, a recapture for one of these fish, and that's why it says four here. Um, but let's see two here. That that's a little suspicious. That it only that one of these fish only did a couple things. But as I zoom in here, I can see different things happening here. So this one, I've I've, I've have an observation downstream here. I have two events up here, but I can also change how that looks by changing the the event variable from event type. I'm going to change that to uh, to rearing type. And so I'm, now I'm looking at um, both the, the wild and the hatchery type, and you can you can see that the um, the the hatchery fish or or the sockeye coming from up here, and then there's one wild fish down here. Um, I'll go over a little bit of more options here, but let me just quickly show what the fish tracks look like. So again, I only have three fish here. One of these fish come from the South Fork. And I can highlight that particular fish, and it has a fairly somewhat of a boring history. It's um, oops, it was released at, at Knox Bridge, and then uh, was uh, was detected at Little Goose, and in fact, this fish was was actually transported, um, and then it uh, was next detected detected at Bonneville, um, came upstream, and eventually. And made it back up to its uh, its spawning area and was and it was recovered at the at the at the South Fork um, weir. Um, the the sockeye are a little bit more interesting. We have a no, I think it was a sockeye that's transported. Excuse me, but um, if I zoom in down here, we see something interesting happening with this particular fish. Um, this. Um, You see, one fish, one of these sockeyes did make it back at least as far as the lower granite dam, although 
if I expand out Lower Granite Dam, I see some other interesting things happening here, like this fish made it to Lower Granite Dam and then it it fell back at some point, fell back over the spillway at GRS and then, then made it back up, but was not subsequently detected upstream. Um, and the this particular fish, though, we can see that it um, it had a, a, a very more sorted life history. It fell back a few times at the Dalles, uh, eventually fell back at Bonneville um, several times before it uh, was never seen again after the last detection at Bonneville. Um, the advantage here for, and that's what I was going for with this tool, is to be able to get two quick looks at what's going on. One, an overall look at where the things happen and where the and and what what's available from the data set but also to be able to look across in time and see things like this things that you don't expect um the part of you know using this tool is, is twofold and even people that have been working with pit, pit tech data a long time might appreciate some of this because a lot of times you don't know what to expect and you just want to get a good click okay what does my query look like and this is what you'd bring it into the second one would be well i think i know what I'm, I'm expecting but there might be something that i don't expect and i don't know how to look for that well this visually gives you information about what about unusual things that are happening that that indicates either that you're you're you know you did the query wrong or there's something biologically interesting that's happening with with the data set so let me move on to a more complicated example, and this is a, um, a group of basically Chinook, which have been uh, moving upstream in, in the year 2021, I believe. And so starting from what the original screen looks like, I have a, a combination of different runs and different ring strategies and basically releases that happen everywhere. Um, the fish tracks also looks rather, uh, very messy, um, but as I, you know, zoom in on certain regions, I can I can clear things up a little bit. So if I click on this on the just the salmon basin, then I'm looking at a smaller group of fish. So these are are just fish that have been released in the in the salmon. If I go back to the map, um, I get a smaller number. Um, and here I can choose um, choose the release space. And again, these are all salmon, so that's not going to be too too useful. But I can also choose um, rearing type. So as so the way that these cluster pies work is as I zoom in, it's basically revealing more and more sites that at a finer detail. So this lets you look at some kind of an aggregate group categorized by by certain variable and as you zoom more and more you get you get finer and finer resolution within the site to the point where you've you've identified a a single site and if i can click on that site uh this is now the sawtooth trap and this is the uh here's a sawtooth trap and this is a, a release site so you have both uh if i go back to event types that looks like here so i have release and recoveries here if i'm just interested i can choose just i just want to look at recaptures i don't want to look at releases and some of the sites fall off but the other the other thing that's possible with this map view is to look at the um go look at the environmental variables so let's go up Right now, the 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 place that I'm retrieving environmental variables are the main stem dams, um, and the way I can look at those is by instead of choosing that, I'll choose environmental metrics here. So, the first, uh, the the default option is to look at the temperature, and that's selected over here. Um, and so, the way this is represented is categorizing the the particular um, events um for each correlating each of the events for the fish that have, that, have, that have been observed in this case in the in the lower granite area um and using the two sites that are available for lower granite dam which would be upstream and downstream and all of these zoom in and get there so now i have two particular 
sites. So what I've done is taken the sites that are available from the um, that are available from the pit tag data. I'll just kind of go back there and so kind of jump around a little bit because I haven't shown this yet. So here here are the the individual sites where events happen um, for for these fish going upstream. We have we have the juvenile sites down here. We have some observations there. We have um, observations at the at the adult ladder, and then we have uh, observations at the uh, at the spillway. And then here we have some, in this case, recaptures that happened at the uh, um, wherever they recapture fish. There, it's um, it's the adult trap, and sometimes the these locations are not are not exact in Patagis. But this just gives a way of, of being able to see um, where are things happening. So you can right away see that okay, we had 548 of these fish that were that were detected as adults coming upstream through here. We had you know roughly comparable numbers of, of fish that were detected, both juveniles going down, but also uh, juveniles or even the juvenile bypass, but also at the at the uh, um, at, at the spillway. But going back to the environmental metrics, again we have um, we have two sites here. I've, I'm looking at temperature, and you can see here this is spanning the 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 entire period of time. But so when you look at this and see, I have uh, I have 483 fish that when they were detected at this or when they were detected in the vicinity here um, of this site, this particular environmental site. The temperature was less than 10 degrees, but 152 of them, the, the temperature was 18 to 20, and a, and a small number, the temperature was was fairly high, 20 to 22. And this is the USA WG site. Um, down, here's the downstream site. And you see what you look for is, is changes that occur in, in, the, in the temperature. So going down, going from the from the four bay down to the tail race, we can see that the, the temperatures generally increase. Um, looking at the, there's also dissolved gases give us uh, the similar information. So you can see that the change for each fish's experience going from the up from the four bay side down to the downstream side, and by changing the the event danger range here, you can look you can zoom in on a particular uh, time periods at which some of these things happen. So it's um, by if I change here, you can see I've 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 changed down down the or I've narrowed the time window uh, to when I'm looking for events. Um, the I'm not sure which one this is. This is going to be this is the bull trout. So here's an example of of a bull trout spanning several years, and and in fact, um, can we look at the uh, the release times that happened here? Um, the release. So these have. This is a, a combined data set where I went and basically looked at all the bull, bull trout data that have been released in from like 2000 and uh, you know that were actually not released but were detected from from 2018, I believe, through through the the present time, and it it will then include a bunch of fish that were released earlier. But this kind of gives a, a quick snapshot of where all the bull trout detections have been um, for the last few years. Um, if I go to my uh, fish tracks chart, I can look at, um, zoom in on, see some interesting things that there's the this uh, activity for the Imnaha fish is kind of interesting. So I will select uh, lower snake and uh, in Imnaha. Well, I'm going to look Hell's Canyon and Imnaha in this case. Um, so again, I'm looking at, at a particular um, a, a subset of the original data set, and it's showing um, the interesting migration of fish that happened seasonally with these these bull trout going uh, going from um, down in the the Upper Snake um, River. Up at the up at the, the Imnaha and and back down again through the years. And if I can go further and just look at one particular uh, year here, so I'm going to look at fish that are released in 2001. 
And so depending on, and this is, so this is, you know, fish for one particular release year, again, coming upstream and coming downstream. So you can see some interesting stuff, but you can go through and, and, and select a particular group of these and pretty much all of them kind of went up here. Um, you know, not, a, not all of them were detected at different sites, but anyway, this provides a way of, of really um, honing in on very specific behaviors of fish and being able to export that. Um, so as an example of that, I'll just kind of do a little export here. I'm going to click this export thing here, which will allow me to, again, select the types of import exports I want to do. Um, if I click this one, and I'll click proceed there, and then this shows up in my download folder. If I, if I again look for that, I can expand that out and see what it looks like. And I have, I have several files here. For these particular ones, I did not get any environmental variables since it's really not applicable to the bull trout data as much. Um, but if I look at this particular you know, CSV file. I see I basically repopulated the uh, um, the type of output that you might expect where I have tag codes and species and all these things and tenor groups named. Um, so you can take this and and, you know, do other things with it. Uh, similarly, I can look at, in this case, the metadata. Um, again, I didn't I had not saved the, the one from Batagis here, but this this is an example of what the, the metadata file would look like. The filters that I've used includes the a list of the filters that I've applied. Uh, again, I selected Dimnaha and Hell's Canyon um, release areas um, as particular basin, and then the particular year group. Um, so this is just just an example of the type of information that that could be gleaned from this. I'll just uh, I'll do I'll just show one more example here. Um, this is a combination file where I I was just going to look at for for the year 2022 fish that were tagged going upstream at the Bonneville uh, Adult Fish Facility, and so and basically consists of of Chinook and steelhead, and this just kind of gets me a queer a, a quick snapshot for each of these species of of where these fish ended up. So again, we're we're, we're talking about fish that were that were um, that were tagged down here. I'm going to look at. Uh, I'm not going to look at. Uh, let's see, because the rear makes it all the same, so it's basically that. But I'll I'll, I'll do rearing type anyway, since it's all in no how that doesn't look good. Uh, let's do fish run, um, which is again unknown. But this uh, just a quick way of saying, OK, I've, we've tagged fish down at Bonneville. Where did they end up and how many go where? And so we see, um, you know, up through McNary, there's there's 600 fish that are going this way. About 500, um, 500 of those are going this way. And we have a number going this way. So um, that's for steelhead, excuse me. But uh, whereas for, for Shinook, the uh, the situation is is somewhat different. We have, you know, there's a couple thousand here. About half of them are going up this up the up the snake, and about half of them are going the other way. So it's just kind of rough numbers of, of where things are happening and where they're ending up. Uh, and again, you can select, you can go in and select particular groups to see what they look like. We're just interested in the fish here. Um, let me show how this can work. I'm just interested in. In this group of fish going up the um, up the limb high, I can come over to here and say, okay, I'm going to create uh, this thing that says limb high. And then I add that as a chart. Gives me a very small number of the total, but I can click through there and then go back to my fish tracks. And now I'm just looking at the fish, you know, both both in the map view, but also in the um, so these are just the events for for these this, these fish that were eventually detected in the Lemhi basin, uh, subbasin, and here are the particular tracks for those. So uh, we can see that a number of those fish um, were detected in the you know in in this range here, 
particular sites. Some of you know these two are are, are actually below where the, the Lemhi is, but the um, some were in the projected up in the Pasimari as well. So I've ran through those examples. Let me. Um, I provided some links to some other example tools that I've used that that um, not. That basically the idea with with this tool for my own use is to is to have the the basic tool to be able to import um, files, process them, be able to, to, to do some exploratory analysis and export but also to be able to create some some custom uh, widgets and tools that allow me to get additional information such as run timing or or, or uh, travel times going in and out and i've created examples of some of these tools and some of them listed here um the the idea for pithy is is to not integrate everything into there but to, to make it possible to extend the basic pithy into doing other things besides just a simple analysis that I've shown here. Um, some next steps um, we're again talking with uh, going to present for the the Potasia steering committee um, and to, co to continue this discussion. Um, certainly interested in in some feedback for uh, additional opportunities about how to do this. Uh, one idea. Um, is you think about the the raw data. W one thing that I've always wanted wanted for a particular analysis was just a list of the tag IDs that was used for a particular analysis, and how can that be? Um, that might be something that includes in the output just the just the tag IDs, a list of the ones that were in the raw data, and that way you know what the starting point was. Um, there's lots of other, other opportunities for visualizing some of these other attributes within the site, being able to change things like this pruning time limit. Um, is there a way to to come up with a, a place to store outputs that that could be reused? So to be able to take an export, re-import it in, or put it on some kind of an archive that people could link to and say, OK, just link this up. Um, and there's obviously lots of ideas that can spring from this. So, so, you know, standards for for archiving or for how do we correlate environmental data with sites and what does that mean? Um, because it's it's there's a lot of sort of fuzziness in how that can happen since there's both upstream and downstream sites, hourly, daily. Um, what does that what does that mean for a particular analysis? So with that, I'll conclude and and um, and hope for some some questions and discussion. Yeah, actually, we had uh, Rick Heinrichsen asked a question early on, um, and there's this is a kind of a three three part question. So I'll just kind of start with the first one. Uh, will Pithy be available on GitHub? Uh, yes, I will. I will put the whole thing available on GitHub for other people, hopefully for other people to contribute or just to have it in a particular space um right now it's you know it's deployed on on the one fish two fish server um but it can it, it's really portable it doesn't require any specific server environment requirements uh with with one particular exception and that is um the map um some of the the map layers are um do require a, a particular uh, map tiling server that I also deploy on one fish, two fish, but the basic program does not require anything on the server. OK, perfect. Uh, and how much uh, maintenance is required? Um, the maintenance comes down to. The, the, the maintenance challenge comes down to one thing, and I'll show you what that is. It's in it. It's right here in this in the fish tracks. Um, this particular grouping of sites is designed to to be able to show you to to be able to separate in 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 a spatial sense both uh, latitude and longitude these particular sites from one another. So as you can see, it goes from Bonneville up through uh, Lower Granite Dam, but then there's a 
uh, or through, even through the Lemhi. Um, actually, that's not a good place to look at that. It's this. It's the. Uh, let's see. Maybe. Look at all over here. Okay, so again, this is a, a whole bunch of fish, but you can see I go up through uh, through Lower Granite Dam, um, but then I I take a break after I get as far up the uh, the, the Salmon River as I can go. Um, then all of a sudden I'm in the clear. Uh, then I'm in the uh, the clear water, um, but then I'm in the um, Lower Granite Dam, and and then. But then I'm all of a sudden in the ha. So you can see it's it's kind of going, it's jumping around. It's basically following a going, you know, following upstream, taking a tributary. And then when you get to the end of that tributary, there's no more sites there. You come back and start over. Well, the file that does that is not is not something that's that's uh, readily uh, calculatable. I mean, I have different groupings here for little glue, uh, little goose dam. Um, but sometimes there's additional sites that are close by there that there's no easy way to get that from just the, the RKM. And so what happens is every time Patagis comes up with new sites, um, those sites don't readily get placed in one of these particular uh, categories. And so uh, the maintenance is really being able to identify changes in, in the Patagis, um, either the the interrogation site lists or the uh, the MR sites, um, MMR, and be able to integrate those into here. So it's maintaining a particular file. Other than that, things happen pretty much um, automatically retrieving from Dart. So um, the maintenance right now, it's more, more a, a, de a development issue and maintaining the file, which allows this, this particular categorization. Okay, awesome. Um, last question from Rich. Uh, and where will the tool be housed? Um, right now, the tool is housed at, 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 at there's a there is a link on the one fish two fish site. Um, that will just go back and show that here. Um, so if you click, it's right now it's under shiny tools. I'll make it more prominent, but there is it is pithy is down here, so you can you can find it here. Um, there'll be other in the future, there might be even more prominent places for it. It just, as it's being developed in the early stages, it's sort of um, just now sort of being revealed and made available. But I encourage people to try it out. There's a lot of things that aren't going to be um, working yet. If you click on a help, it's not going to give you really any help. About it's going to give you um, a, an excerpt from uh, one a, a man in, a, a man in the sea or something like that. And so. Um, not everything is going to be working. If things don't work, just reload the thing and try again because um, it's still going to be in, in, in some development mode. Um, so I anticipate there's going to be issues, but I would appreciate on people trying it out with uh, with your own data sets. Again, with the constraints of you know trying to make sure you have some release information as well as the uh, um, the sort of attribute set that I highlighted earlier. I'll put those things in a help to, to to sort of clarify, make sure that it's it's clear what types of things can be processed and how things are exported. Um, and if you guys have access to chat, uh, Russ, drop the link. And then when I send out the follow up email, I'll be sure to um, add some links too, so it'll be easier for you guys to access. Or if anyone's dropped off the meeting, um, any more questions? Feel free to type them in the chat, and I can read them. Or you can unmute yourself and ask Brian a question. I'll just kind of give you a minute. And if you guys do have questions about the task, and you just marinated on it and have a question now, feel we're just going to open it up too for questions for that. All right. All right, Brian. Oh, Russ, I see you. Oh, I just dug off uh, since we were just wrapping up. I just want to say thank you, Brian, for the presentation, uh, taking your time to show this to people. Um, and I was just unmuting. 
<laughs> yeah, no problem. Thanks, Brian. We really appreciate it. I think this helps people kind of get a feel for the pithy tool and and kind of how to how to use it and get some of the information out of it. Um, I am going to steal the screen back from you. The the comment I wanted to make quickly was just that this is just one example. Uh, I think it highlighted a couple points uh, for the fish monitoring work group, some next steps and opportunities for pit tag discussions and data management. How do we share the data? How do we store the data? How do we pull in related data? How do we make sure that related temperature data, not just for the dams, but for tributaries can be made available and accessible and shared? Um, how do we find that information? How do we uh, make it more easy to access and use? I think those are you know, some great opportunities for us to continue with the Fish Monitoring Work Group on pit tags and, and discussions with Marika. Uh, and it's an opportunity to discuss this tool, pit cleaner, um, Dart, any other tool that exists um, that you know people may be wanting to use or have ideas to update. Um, I think this is a a good kickoff of a way to you know, share that information and discuss it. So. Perfect, Russ. I think that's a good wrap up. Um, and I will just add on a little bit to that. Uh, just a reminder on where to find some general fish monitoring work group information. You can access information by visiting the project page on pnamp.org. Uh, project page contains links to each task page where you can find task descriptions, documents, upcoming meetings, uh, links to previous meetings, and ways to contact the task leads if you have specific questions or want to be part of the group. Um, if you'd like to be added to the distribution list, just send me an email and I can add you. Um, as you heard earlier, our <coughs> leads are busy on each task and occasionally send out calls for feedback on draft products. Uh, so if you want to be a subject matter expert or participate in a particular task, uh, let me know and I can add you to those specific lists as well. Uh, the follow-up email and recording will be available tomorrow. Uh, this group will convene again on April 20th from 10 to 1130. Um, and to close out for today, I'd like to say thanks again uh, to Brian Mashoff for presenting, uh, the Fish, uh, Fish Monitoring Work Group core team, the task leads, and you guys, the participants. Um, all right, and that's it for me. Have a great rest of your day.